So we've been talking a lot uh, in general about the uh, metagenic potential of chemotherapy. Let's hone in now on the drugs that we use and how we approach highly metagenic chemotherapy, moderately metagenic chemotherapy. So we already mentioned there's several classes of drugs, and the first cornerstone of therapy were the serotonin antagonist and a specific subtype of serotonin, 5-HT3, and we have receptor antagonists there. So Don, can you tell us a little bit about where we are with that and how we got there? Sure. So we're lucky enough now to have a handful of 5-HT3 antagonists, and we now can separate them out into the first generation and second generation 5-HT3 antagonists. So the first generations being the undansetron, dilacetron, granisetron, oral. Um, and then the second generations being our newer agents, palinocetron and the uh, subcutaneous uh, granisetron. So some very unique differences. You know, those early first generations typically have a shorter half-life. Um, pretty good for preventing acute nausea, but not so great in the delayed phase is what we're finding, and probably not adding a whole lot of value in giving those drugs in the delayed phase. But our new agents, the palinocetron and subcutranistron, you know, n not, um, not only do they have a much longer half-life, but they do definitely have some s distinct differences that set them apart with regards to receptor binding that make them, you know, more potent. Um, they definitely have uh, higher efficacy rates compared to the first generation 5-HT3 uh, antagonists. What, uh, do you use palinocetron based yes. on that? Yes, we are uh, exclusively using palinocetron right now. And you give that at, at when? Uh, 30 minutes prior to uh, chemotherapy. And one dose for the entire period because of the receptor binding and the half-life? Usually one dose. Um, what we're noticing, and there's some newer data to say that uh, you can probably redose palinocetron. So with our BEP regimen, so bleomycin, etoposide, and cisplatin for uh, testicular patients, we're actually giving that day one, three, and five to give them that extra protection because of the high doses of cisplatin that they're getting. And you mentioned orals, are IV and orals, what's the equivalence that you, you see between those? So all of these 5-HT3 antagonists are considered equally efficacious at equal, equal potent doses, whether they're um, oral or IV, depending on um, the dose. What kind of toxicities do you see? Uh, nicely, they uh, have pretty low toxicities. The big biggies, of course, that we see are headache and uh, constipation. and. I will tell you, though, that even though we think these are pretty benign drugs, those can be pretty significant side effects for some patients. You know, some patients come back um, and say, gosh, the constipation, I think, might be worse than, than the nausea or it might be contributing to the nausea. So it is something that we definitely have to have on our radar, despite the, the percentage being quite low. Yeah. We, we see constipation as being the number one on the hit parade of side effects yeah. with uh, palinocetron, and we use it pretty much as the standard. Um, but the number is relatively small. I'm saying about you know three percent yeah. mm. is a good estimate. Um, so we don't see too many, but the patients will come in and specifically say that the headaches not so much they'll deal with. Yeah. Um, but constipation, not so, they don't want to deal with. So That's do you educate problem. the patients beforehand about those, or are they rare enough that you wait to hear it's, responses? We wait to hear responses. I don't think you know that's something we throw in as being the biggest problem because we don't want people to go fishing and look for side effects. Um, if they come back and they say after the first cycle, typically, you know, really bad constipation, okay, we're going to adjust the therapy then. But that being said, it's always good to take a quick breeze through the med list because these are oncology patients. They're on other drugs that cause constipation, whether it's a chemotherapy drug like vincristine or um, they're on opioids. Right. So they're on concomitant things that can cause constipation. So if you're adding another bonus to that, it, it could Put become significant for a patient. Yeah. I think it's good as part of your checklist about asking about that specifically because if they're ready on opioids and have constipation, perhaps they would get a little bit more with that. Eric, how do you deal with uh, these complications and once you have these side effects? Do you switch your antiemetics? Do you just treat the symptoms? What's your approach? Yeah, so my experience has been that it's really a class effect, um, that there isn't one that's better than the other with regard to the side effects. Um, so. Uh, stopping again and uh, educating your patients who are really quite surprised that they need to be more aggressive about a bowel regimen prior to chemo. Everyone thinks they're going to have diarrhea. So um, I sit down, we review their med list. If they're on opioids, I want to ensure that they're taking a stimulant laxative. 
um, which would be Senna or Bisicodal, um, making sure those are at maximum doses. Some people for Senna, for example, with opioids only need one tablet a day and other people need eight. So really letting people know uh, about the stimulant laxatives while they're on opioids. And then um, for 5-HT3 um, induced constipation, I haven't found that one particular drug is more helpful than another. Um, so if it's just purely due to that, I think a softener or an osmotic such as polyethylene glycol would be fine. Good, other thoughts on, on that? Changing or just treating? I think if you're able to, we sometimes will switch it up just because that's an, that's an easy thing to do if you have it available to you. So there are some rare cases where you know, we've taken a patient and switched them from Palo to Ondansetron just to see if it made a difference, especially not, not so much on the constipation end, but the headache. Because I have had some people report those headaches to be pretty severe, last for several days, and not really respond to um, you know, traditional things like Tylenol or ibuprofen, which we don't typically want them to take after chemo because they can mask fevers, but that adds a whole other layer of, of complexity to it. Yeah, I think it's a good point though because many patients don't take anything or don't even call because they've been instructed not to take any analgesics or anti antipyretics and typically in a day or two after chemo that's not, not an a big issue. deal but yeah. they come in oh I had a headache for five days did you call no I just thought that was okay did you take a Tylenol no so sometimes it's again going back to the simple and the education around that and uh, trying to be proactive as we were talking about the 5-HT3s, you know, I noticed a couple of you said we are exclusively using palinocetron. I'm not afraid to say at my institution that palinocetron is our drug of choice for highly metagenic, but in our moderately metagenic patients, we are still using IV on dancitron um, as the first. Now, we are, it's okay, you can delete that and put palinocetron in for any patient and you're not going to be questioned on that necessarily. Um, but if you're looking purely at cost, um, you know, that's when you have to start deciding about these drugs, how much of this is an issue. And, you know, you can certainly argue the point that the cost of nausea vomiting and the admission rate and hydration is a higher cost than actually just using these drugs up front. Um, but that being said, at our institution, we are still using Ondansetron um, at 16 milligrams IV for our moderately metagenic regimens and with the option of adding an NK1 receptor antagonist. Have you been using the sub-Q granisetron at all? We have not used that yet, um, but I think it's something that is also an option. Well, what's, in what's interesting about what, what you just mentioned is cost is an issue for everybody now. Obviously, we're an OCM practice, um, as you are, um, and on our first review, they talked to us about cost of treatment. Um, on the back end is the cost of not treating, and that's hard to quantify. When we first looked at um, what we were going to be doing with NK1s six, seven years ago, we sat down, we looked at it, and we said, okay, we're going to add them on, and we're going to do like, like you said. You know, certainly the highly metagenic regimens um, will get the add-on. Um, the moderately metagenic regimens, it's a choice. It's not standard, but if you choose, it's there. So it made it easy for people to go with that. Um, and when we did that, we looked at outcomes over the next year, and we dropped our... ER rates by 40% for nausea and vomiting, just by paying attention. Um, so the question then is, do we go backwards in our mind, saying, oh, we're gonna go back from you know, palinocetron, we're gonna go back to what we used to do. Is that gonna affect the back end again? We're not willing to do that. It's a patient issue to start. Um, OCM is a whole nother story and uh, I, I wonder where it's gonna wind up, looking at you know, baselines and comparing everybody, here's the benchmark. And the benchmark may be from people who have tons of admissions to the ER. Well, that's nice, but you know, do we wanna drop to that level because that is the benchmark? Because people weren't giving optimal therapies in certain regard, and this is one of those. So I kind of, I kind of wonder where the dollars fit in, and I understand they do fit in. Um, you know, one of the concerns you mentioned, you know, the granisetron injection, it's really expensive. And, you know, does it add a huge advantage? We're not certain. And the cost certainly is an issue there to change it to something that's very expensive. We, we kind of shied away from it. 
That, so. That's a new kid on the block that a lot of people are not familiar with. Uh, maybe Lee, yeah. you could tell us more about it. Yeah, we've been using it now for some time in our AC patients, which I don't think we've mentioned yet are highly emetogenic, and that was reclassified as highly emetogenic uh, some years ago. And that's really for any dose of AC, although, of course, most of the patients who are getting that is, are in the adjuvant setting and have the additional risk factors of being young females in breast cancer. So they have uh, those additional factors. But AC is a highly metagenic regimen. We've had good results with mm -hmm. it. Uh, cost is definitely an issue in, in general. And I think looking at total costs, as you suggest, are really yeah. important. So uh, we've seen very good control with the subcutaneous granisetron. Um, it is a subcutaneous injection, but it really hasn't proven to be difficult. The way that that works differently than, uh, it's still granisetron, but it's released in a polymer, so you get a high peak and then a delayed effect as opposed to having uh, either a continuous amount of, of release as with the uh, previous patch form that is still available as well, but has to be started 24 hours in, in advance of the chemotherapy, so you get up to effective levels, or to uh, standard uh, oral or IV granisetron, which is, well, a little different. But I think it's interesting. Um, we could have a healthy debate on using palinositron in MEC, in HEC, but not MEC, because actually the data supports in doublet therapy that that's where you see the advantage of PALO over the first generations. And there may not be as much advantage of PALO when you add the NK1. So um, we might argue it the other way, but I mean, I certainly see how every different institution can come to different, uh, to different conclusions based on the data. I think also we give you know, much more MEC regimens than we do HEC regimens anymore these days. So. I think the feeling was, you know, okay, we'll give them the strongest possible, you know, medication for the HEC regimen, but MEC is making up, you know, maybe 75% of our treatment regimens. So in that effect, that would be a lot of dollars to switch from IV on Dancitron to IV Palinocitron in our setting anyway. We've kind of merged the two. So um, but we use on Dancitron in the inpatient setting because we know patients get it. Um, and when we're worried about compliance um, with patients, we use Palo in the, mostly in the outpatient setting.